Hi everyone. Welcome to this event. My name is Claire Talwalkar. I'm the um, I'm a core faculty with the Global Poverty and Practice Minor, and I'm also a lecturer with Political Economy and Global Studies. Uh, welcome to the Tell Her Story uh, Development Panel. Um, welcome especially to our panelists who have arrived from other cities and towns and other countries. Aisha Chandrikar, we're going to meet them all um, soon. Karishma Ali, they're sitting up front here for now. Bharati Singh Chauhan, so welcome to you all. Um, I think it's worth taking a moment to just um, note that it's kind of an amazing thing to be gathered here with these three um, panelists. Um, Aisha and Karishma have uh, come from different places in Pakistan. Aisha's here from Karachi. And Karishma, her work is in Chitra, which is a, a northern uh, rural part of Pakistan. You're based, Karishma, you told me, in Islamabad, so she travels back and forth. And then our third panelist, Bharti, she's from uh, Jaipur in Rajasthan in Western India. And they haven't uh, met before. They, uh, they met themselves only just this morning. Um, and that is because they have risen to the top uh, in a contest. So I just want to say a few words about that contest because there are probably people here who don't, don't know about it. Um, this is the second year of the Telha Story contest. Um, it's a contest that is run through Facebook, so it's through social media online. Um, contestants and supporters of the contestants, they get to know about the contest through sharing on Facebook. And uh, they're invited uh, to identify women they know, South Asian women they know, who are remarkable uh, or are doing remarkable things. And they're invited to tell their story and submit that in a short kind of story format uh, via Facebook. So that happened this year for the second time. Uh, over 100 um, contestants submitted their stories with their supporters. And uh, through a process of selection, 12 semi-finalists were identified. And those semi-finalist names and stories were shared with a few faculty around the country who helped winnow it down to this final threesome. And tomorrow, if you happen to be in the peninsula, you can stop by Facebook because there's going to be the big gala event tomorrow in Facebook. Facebook is one of the sponsors of this contest, uh, where there will be judges and there will be the final selection of a winner. Of course, all three are considered winners already, uh, but there is this final process tomorrow. So, I just have to say a few thank yous real quick. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the people who came up with this idea and this event uh, are the dynamic husband-wife team, Umair and Zareen Khan. And their companies are important sponsors for the event. So Folio 3 is Umair Khan's company. Also the Mentors Fund, he serves as a founding partner on it. They have supported this event. Zareen, uh, owns and runs an amazing restaurant in Palo Alto. That restaurant is also supporting this event. Facebook, of course, is a sponsor. We thank Facebook for their support. Also here on campus, the Institute for South Asia Studies, the Blum Center for Developing Economies, which is where we are at the moment, uh, have supported this event. Thank you to them. Thank you also to the Political Conflict, Gender, and People's Rights Research Initiative, which is based in UC Berkeley's Center for Race and Gender. And finally, thank you also to the UC Berkeley program for a Masters of Development Practice. So we have many sponsors who have made this possible. So what we're going to do today is we're going to hear from each of our panelists. Um, they will take about 15 minutes in which in which 15 minutes each of them will two of them will share a video and then they will talk a little bit um, and then one of them has a PowerPoint and some videos embedded in, and all of that will also take her 15 minutes so I'll introduce each of them and after we've heard from all of them we'll have some time for Q&A. So the first presenter will be Aisha Chandrikar. 
Uh, Aisha brings together in really fascinating ways her passion for psychotherapy and her concern with violence in Pakistan, especially towards certain groups of people, the disabled women survivors of domestic violence, and also violence toward non-human animals, dogs, donkeys, and others. So we're going to hear first from Aisha, and uh, we'll take from there. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again for having me here. I'm very, very grateful. So a little bit I just wanted to say about the work that I do. So a lot of people think I'm um, an animal rights activist. And I, I keep saying I think it's, it's something more than just that. There's a lot more to what I'm trying to do in Pakistan. I am trying to talk about compassion and... How's this? Is this all right? Okay. I'm trying to talk about compassion and empathy on a scale that really hasn't been spoken about before in the country. And I'm trying to make people think in a very critical... <clears throat> How's this? Is yeah. it better? Yeah? Yes. Okay. So to think in a very critical way about why it's so difficult to be kind. Um, because the, one of the biggest issues I keep seeing in my work as a psychotherapist, working with animals for the past six years, is the fact that it's so difficult to just, not just forget being kind, just coexisting with other living beings which is actually a very huge problem in civil society in general. So just a quick story before I show you the presentation, is that when I was younger, I uh, went through some severe trauma, <clears throat> a very, very severe trauma that a child can go through. And honestly, the only way that I am standing here today and the fact that I recovered from all of that is, and the fact that I don't have shame when I'm talking about it and I can be vulnerable enough to talk about it, is because I had animals who got me through it. So when I would cry, I would sort of nuzzle and nestle into the fur of my dogs and my goats or whatever animal I had at the time. And they really actually saved me in so many ways. So, you know, when people say, oh, will you save animals? It's like, I, I think they saved me and I, I owe them. And there's such a symbiotic connection over there. And I'll say a little more about that after we watch the presentation. Thank you. After completing a degree in English literature and philosophy, I did a master's in journalism. I wanted to highlight stories that were generally ignored and that nobody talked about. I made films for BBC and Channel 4 in the UK, and then in Pakistan on humanitarian topics that weren't really highlighted. One of the biggest stories that shook me was when I stumbled upon the intense connection between child sexual abuse and heroin addiction in Peshawar. Spending so much time talking to pedophiles as young as 10 years old, heroin addicts who were 5 years old, prostituting themselves and the men who raped them. I realized the missing link, the obvious gap in our country that is completely ignored is empathy. No one knows what empathy and compassion actually is. By this time, I started another degree in humanistic psychotherapy and specialized in working with kids so I could really get to the root of this issue. I realized I didn't just want to report on the stories, I wanted to be on the front lines to change the stories. And that's how ACF came about. The vision being to help and empower those who have been completely neglected and forgotten by society. And of course, I had to start with animals because nothing has ever been done for them since Pakistan's inception. There are millions of dogs and cats and hundreds of thousands of donkeys that we see on the road every day being tortured, abused in agony. But no one looks, no one cares. We have become immune to suffering and have forgotten basic kindness which is to do something for those who cannot give you anything in return. So I started the first rescue ambulance, sanctuary, shelter and hospital for street and working animals so they can have some dignity and some rights and used social media to start spreading my message of kindness. I started with only one volunteer vet and myself and today after six years of overcoming so many difficulties, changing mindsets and explaining why this is so important, we have 45 staff members, a sanctuary that houses over 500 animals at a time and we have rescued over 5,000 animals. 
from having acid and boiling water thrown on cats to having the tail and ears of a dog cut off to hanging a dog from a telephone pole and to poisoning and shooting dogs to mercilessly torching donkeys the severity of animal abuse we have discovered that goes on in Pakistan is shocking and disturbing to a whole other level we are breeding violence and that had to be highlighted from 50 followers on facebook we organically went up to over 60000 die hard supporters a movement of animal rights and kindness started in pakistan 6 years ago with acf and society is changing for the better We go into slums and help donkey owners by providing free medical treatment, food and water to the animal. That is their only source of making a living. We also try to explain that helping the animal and not beating him will help them in the long run. Donkeys are tortured, made to bleed and run on broken legs, given no food and water for days when carrying tons of weight. Pakistan is one of the largest donkey populated countries in the world yet there is nothing being done for them donkey owners are one of the largest segments of daily wages but there's no one to support them we are trying to cover that gap we also work in the forgotten brick kilns in punjab where bonded slave labor is still a norm and there's no support and children adults and the animals are made to work long exhausting hours for next to nothing and treated so brutally there's no medical facility available to people working in the kilns children are covered in gangrene tuberculosis eye infection throat infections is so common amongst other diseases so we started a human medical camp side by side to our donkey camps and provide free treatment to people in those areas also We have a small team who work non-stop and the results have been phenomenal. We took our work a step further to give our work a holistic approach. We cover animals, humans and the environment together. It was this three-dimensional model that won us the WWF Green Innovation Challenge in 2019. We created an eco-friendly dog leash made out of 100% ghost net, the plastic net that inundates the oceans and kills marine animals. By incentivizing fishermen to extract ghost net, we then trained and empowered women in impoverished fishing villages to braid the net into rope and then have our in-house team adorn it with colorful yarn. This was our first business model. 50% of the funds generated going to the fishing villages and the other half back into our foundation. It's a win-win all around. We follow the same model to teach donkey owners to make humane plastic harnesses for donkeys out of plastic sacks in which fruits and vegetables are sold. The current harnesses in the market are made of rough coarse material with nails in it because the age-old belief is that the more you torture a donkey the more he will work. Raw material that we use doesn't cost a thing and we aim to equip them with a new skill to benefit the donkey owners and the animal in the long run. We also teach them about donkey behavior and how to get the work out of their animal without violence which then won us another grant from the donkey sanctuary in the UK. My team and I went to Nepal for a training with them and then carried out the first official national equine assessment survey in Pakistan in the hopes of understanding the situation to improve it. The work we do is rooted in thinking forward and adhering to a bigger vision of trying to make empathy a norm in our culture. In the 6 years I've been working with animals, I have learned more about human behavior than when I was a therapist or journalist. Empathy and violence are two sides of the same coin. If we can bring about a switch and people can learn to be more empathic towards the most vulnerable, they will learn to be more compassionate overall and to each other. Animal cruelty is the first indicator of more abuse on the line, like domestic violence, sexual abuse, physical abuse and bullying. If one cannot learn to be kinder to the most powerless of living beings and exert violent power instead, our country cannot improve morally or otherwise. This is not a westernized concept but a, but a civilized one. I aim on working on the cause of the problem, not the symptoms.
We run empathy education programs in schools and kids from private and public schools, specially able children, those who have been through severe drug addiction and sexual abuse and acid burn survivors visit us. Animals have a way of healing trauma by providing a non-judgmental space and that's what our sanctuary has now become, a platform of compassion and the impact has been astounding. I had hired one of my therapy clients, an acid burn survivor, to work for the shelter because she was being exploited and paid next to nothing and people just stared at her like she was a monster. Her husband had poured four bottles of acid on her head. She didn't have an eye or an ear or hair and she was covered in layers of cloth so no one saw her. However, in three months of working with us, she made the most remarkable transformation removed the layers, wore our cap and our shirt, and said that animals don't see what's on the outside. They don't judge. They provided to her the purest reflection back, which had been robbed from her by her own traumatic experiences and other people. The question I get the most often is why are you helping animals and not people? These are the types of stories that explain that the work we do has effects so far reaching it is incredible. Why do we have to decide who to be kind to? Why does kindness have to come with conditions attached to it? It doesn't take anything away from a person to be kind to an animal. In fact, it just makes us more humble and caring. A few examples now of how our work has impacted so many people. मेरा नाम शीमा खान है बचपन से मुझे मेरी कमर में प्रॉब्लम है जिसका नाम डायस्टोमेटामेली है जब मैं बाहर जाती थी तो लोग मुझे देखते थे मेरी प्रॉब्लम की वजह से और मुझे ऐसा फील करवाते थे कि जैसे मैं अपनी लाइफ में कभी आगे नहीं बढ़ सकती उनकी नज़रों में मुझे अपने लिए सिंपति नज़र आती थी जो मुझे कभी पसंद नहीं आई जब मैं ए में आई तो मुझे कभी नहीं लगा था कि मैं डॉग्स के साथ या बड़े किसी भी जानवर के साथ काम कर सकती हूँ पर वक्त के साथ और एनिमल्स में रहकर मुझ में एक कॉन्फिडेंस आया एनिमल्स ने मुझे मेरी लाइफ के मीनिंग सिखाए और आज मुझे ऐसा फील होता है कि मैं अपनी लाइफ में कुछ भी कर सकती हूँ मेरे एनिमल्स ने मुझे कभी जज नहीं किया उन्होंने मुझे प्यार किया विथ ऑल प्योरिटी आज मुझे मेरी फिजिकल कंडीशन से कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है मैं अपनी लाइफ में बहुत पॉजिटिव और मोटिवेटेड हूँ और ये सब कुछ मेरे एनिमल्स की वजह से and i am very thankful of that kyunki mera parz hai agar ek janwar bezaban hai humne kuch kiya to wo kitna usko kitna takleef hote hai ki hamara ko pata nahi hai वो जानवरों को पता है जब हमारा को गोली वगैरह या कुछ छोटे से भी चोट लग जाते हम रोने लग जाते तो बिल्ली कैसे रोते हो बिल्ली का भी तो दिल है ना यार बिल्ली का भी तो अकल है जबान भी अकल तो है ना ये तो सही बात हमारा तो फिर दोनों चीज़ है जबान भी अकल भी है जहन भी है I am an ambassador for the ACF Animal Rescue on the streets of Pakistan. There are many animals that are in need, and ACF endeavours to help them all. Or that there was a dog in a wheelchair, just like me, and it was really awesome. It is important to look after animals because they have feelings too. So we should consider supporting them on on Twitter and all over the world. I hope you like it. Goodbye and good night to you all. guys liked the presentation i tried to put a lot of things in there 
Uh, the one thing actually that I wasn't able to add because I'm still working on it currently and in fact my team is currently at uh, a court hearing in Pakistan, they're going to be going there because uh, animal rights and uh, kindness in general across the country has finally been recognized as something that needs to happen. So I am actually now making legislation and I am in the process of getting a proper petition made to actually uh, bring about some form of recognition for the most neglected and ignored um, living beings in society, which has never happened in the seven plus decades of Pakistan's existence. So this is a really big step for us that actually things are changing. And it just goes to show that if you just stay really persistent and you really focus on what the right thing to do is, if you don't, if it, you know, if, if we can focus on the superficial issues, which is which are also very important, but if you don't get to the root of the problem, which is that we really have this inability to understand each other, especially where I come from. Uh, there's just so many superficial issues that block us from really getting to the root of the problem. So I'm really grateful that we're actually getting there now and we're truly seeing this movement of kindness come about in my country. So thank you.